Really glad to have you here with us this morning. Excited to continue in our journey through the story of Jonah. What just an interesting story it has been. Uh, but before I do, I just want to say thank you to Brad Hoganson. I know he's not here, but it was so kind of him to come and share with us. It's always great to hear him open up God's word for us and share with us. Uh, yeah, he just has a, a really great way of telling a story uh, and sharing God's word. So I'm so thankful for him and thankful for the time he got to share last week. But if I'm being honest, I'm also really thankful that I got a chance uh, to rest a little bit. And uh, me and Caitlin got to go visit some friends. Last weekend we went down to Peoria, Illinois. Nothing special there. But it was 80 degrees and we had friends. So that's a great combination. I know. It was fantastic. Uh, so that was really, you know, sometimes it just feels good to sweat. I don't know. something. You get cold long enough and you're like, oh, this is great. So we enjoyed that. We had a great time. And uh, yeah, just enjoy that rest. But today, as we continue on through Jonah, we're going to go to chapter 3. We're going to open that up together. You can find that in your bulletin. It'll be on the screen, uh, or you can follow along in your Bible. But today's theme is going to be mercy. We're going to talk about God's mercy uh, together and really looking at uh, who God is and how he's made himself into one that so desperately desires to come alongside of, of us with compassion and with mercy. And I'm really thankful for God's mercy. And one of the biggest reasons is that as humans, we're so stubborn sometimes. I, we were down visiting our friends, and they have, uh, one of them has a nine-month-old. His name is Finn. And it's impressive to see a nine-month-old running around. I mean, he just figured out how to walk real early. He's got those motor skills, and he's going, just a little bitty guy, and he's just zooming all over the place, right? But even though he has the ability, the balance, the coordination, whatever, to do that, he doesn't quite have the logic, the wisdom to know like where to walk and where not to. So as soon as we got out to the porch, as soon as you set him down, he would right zoom to the place where he could fall off every time. And you, you, you go and you stop him, you pick him up, you bring him back over, and it doesn't take long, and he finds himself zooming all right back over to the place. He just, he's taken himself straight towards something that's not great for him. And he just can't help it, and he's so excited to get there on his way. He's laughing, he's smiling, he's excited, he's holding whatever treasure he found, and he's on his way to falling off the edge, right? He just doesn't know any better. And sometimes I'm just sitting there watching him, and I'm like, boy, I'm not that different from you, buddy. It's okay. I do that to myself all the time. Sometimes just to get excited, and I move towards something that's just not great for me. Sometimes as humans, we're just stubborn. And sometimes it's because we just struggle so deeply to ask for help. I... I <laughs> I know for me, this goes all the way back to when I was a kid, and me and my brother uh, would wrestle some with each other, with our dad, but we never wanted to cry uncle or say, like, no, 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 I'm done. We'd always go uh, to my mom's frustration until there were tears or bruises or whatever, right? We always just go too far because we didn't want to admit, like, oh, maybe I should ask for help. Maybe I should cry uncle here, right? Sometimes we're just really stubborn. And I think what we've seen in the story of Jonah so far is the characters aren't in that different. We look at Jonah and opportunity after opportunity that God has given him to ask for help, to turn and to trust him and follow him and trust his guidance. And today we're going to look at the Ninevites who have just been leading themselves for so long into the path of destruction. Just choosing to be selfish and to walk in a direction that's not going to be beneficial to them. And I think as we've gone through this story, maybe you even ask yourself, or maybe you've seen, like, where do you fit in? Maybe you can relate. Maybe it's to Jonah. Uh, maybe it's in his stubbornness to not trust God and to follow him. Or maybe it's those Ninevites. In part, they're ignorantly moving towards the destruction, kind of like my, friend, uh, my friend's son. But in part, they're choosing uh, to live in their wickedness. And so I just want us to consider for a moment before we get into the story of great mercy, how do we connect here? Because maybe it's with Jonah. And Jonah's thing is really, he knows God, he understands him, but he's just ignoring him. He, and so maybe you can relate to this, this sort of apathy towards God of hearing his words, maybe not audibly, maybe through his word, we can clearly see his commands. And God says in his word that we find our purpose and joy in God. And maybe you're like, nah. I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want to find my purpose in joy in God. This bag of chips looks pretty good right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm going to choose that instead. That's going to give me joy. Or the other day I was helping a friend with a project and this container of cookies. Nothing special about them, but there was a whole container right in front of us and we were hungry. So like they looked pretty great all day long. We just kept going for it. Right? Sometimes we just, we find our joy in the immediate thing that's right in front of us. We just ignore God. 
Sometimes we hide from him, like Jonah does. Maybe we just think, boy, if I just, if I just don't go to church, if I don't spend time around my Christian friends, I'm not going to be faced with some of the things that I know I'm maybe not choosing wisely in my life. Or maybe we're willfully disobeying God. Maybe we ask ourselves, we go, you know, I know God and I know that he's so full of grace and mercy and love that no matter what I do, he's going to forgive me so I can go do whatever I want to do. And we know what Paul says about that. We know he says we should not just go on sinning. But we're so good at convincing ourselves that it's okay sometimes. Or maybe as we looked at a couple weeks ago, you hide behind your religion. You hide behind saying the right things and doing the right things, but not having that heart change. There's so many ways that we can relate in this story, so many reasons that we need God's mercy. Maybe it's like the Ninevites. Maybe you're just pursuing uh, your own selfish gain, what's right in front of you, not caring about others around you, or just living in ignorance, not knowing what's best. But the really good news that we're going to look at today of God's mercy is that no matter who you are, where you are, where you find yourself relating in this story, or what you've done, God is so merciful. And his mercy is one that has continual pursuit of us. It never gives up. God wants to find us. He wants to seek us, and he has enduring patience until we turn back to him. So as we go through the story, I just want to review real quick as we go through, because so far we've looked at mostly just Jonah, and we've focused on all the ways that Jonah's kind of done it wrong, right? And we've talked about this, and we've acknowledged it. But there's also this other parallel line where we see God being continuously merciful towards Jonah and the other characters in the story. We see that God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. He invites him to be a part of this wonderful miracle of turning these people back to him. But Jonah runs away. He has his own vision. And then we see God's mercy again of him sending the storm to turn Jonah back to himself. But Jonah runs further away by being thrown in. And then God mercifully comes back to send the fish to swallow him up. But Jonah, realizing he can't run, uses that religious language. He blames God. He asks God to release him from his troubles. He's so annoyed. But God again sends Jonah into Nineveh to be a part of this miracle. And Jonah comes into Nineveh, as we're going to read today, and delivers this message. And the people turn back to God, and God extends his mercy. So today, we're going to focus a lot less on Jonah. We're going to look at this side of the story where God extends his mercy to everyone, to all of us, and that his mercy and his love is so much more powerful than our sin, than our rejection. The story of Jonah is not just about a prophet who takes a wrong path. It's about a God who is so merciful, and I'm excited to show that and share that with you this morning. So let's go to chapter 3. We're going to take a look at what happens next in our story. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. All right, let's pause. Boy, what if I could preach that short? I know some of you are like, that'd be great, go for it, Pastor. 40 days from now and Fergus Falls will be destroyed. Amen. What? <laughs> that's his sermon? That, I mean, just for a second, just pause and think, that's a little unusual, right? That, that seems, I don't want to be cynical here, but based on what we already know about Jonah, it feels a little bit like he's phoning it in here. 40 days from now and Nineveh will be destroyed. It's this very simple message. Now, to his credit, it does say, if we go back here, uh, let's see. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, get up and go to the city. This time, Jonah obeyed. All right. Jonah obeyed. We're making a little progress here. Jonah followed the Lord. He went to the city to communicate God's message to the people. So to his credit. But he gave this very simple and short sermon It basically says, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Not might be or could be. In Jonah's mind, he's still thinking, they're going to get what's coming to them. I'm just here to tell you, because God told me I need to come here, Nineveh will be destroyed. But there's some really important information missing from this sermon. Maybe some questions like, why? Why is it going to be destroyed? If I was a Ninevite, I'd be going, what did we do? What's coming down the pike here? Who's going to destroy it? You didn't mention anything about any particular god or other army or country. And then 
how do we avoid this? Because we don't want this to happen to us, right? He doesn't give that information. Jonah's giving the bare minimum, I think, because he doesn't want them to be rescued. But of course, we don't know for sure why he preaches this. Maybe this are the exact words that God asked him to share. But I know from looking at other prophets that they often share so much more detail. Just briefly here, we take a look at the prophet Micah, and he comes to speak to God's people, and he says, Attention, let all the people of the world listen. Let the earth and everything in it hear. The sovereign Lord is making accusations against you. So there we go. We see who is it that's coming against them. The sovereign Lord. He speaks from his holy temple. Look, he is coming. He leaves his throne in heaven and tramples the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath his feet and flow into the valleys like wax and a fire, like water pouring down a hill. And why is this happening? Because of the rebellion of Israel. Yes, the sins of the whole nation. Who is to blame for the rebellion? Samaria, the capital, and also where's the idolatry coming from? Jerusalem, its capital. Basically, he's saying, it's coming from you. You are the source of this rebellion, and God is going to come. The God of Israel is going to come to you. It gives much more detail and much more explanation of how to turn. We don't know exactly what it is that God asked Jonah to say. We just know what's recorded here, but we can see very clearly that they knew that Jonah communicated that there would be destruction. So what do the Ninevites do with information like this? How are they going to respond? Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God's message. Wow. (laughs) The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, he took off his royal robes, he dressed himself in burlap, and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree through the city, no one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind He will hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. This is amazing (laughs) that the Ninevites have this response, that they believed God's message, that they humbled themselves as completely as they knew how. It says they wore sackcloth and ashes. This is like burlap that was worn basically in an attempt to rid themselves of all distractions so they could fast, they could pray, and they could come before God. In repentance. Now today, we don't wear burlap. I, I think that's just called turning off your phone. Like if you want to get rid of all distractions, just hold that thing, swipe across, power off, and then come before God in fasting and prayer. They're trying to get rid of all distractions so they can completely focus on God. That is an amazing thing that they're doing. They're completely humbling themselves and coming before him. Even the king, it says, stepped down off of his throne The king of this country that has been so fierce and so vicious and so violent humbles himself and steps down off the throne. Imagine, imagine if any, if if our president or any of our significant leaders in our nation stepped down from their place of authority, put on their sweatpants, and spent several days in a row before God in prayer and repentance. This is an incredible thing that's happening. Jonah must have been in shock that this happened, especially in light of his amazing sermon. And verse 8 says, they turned from their evil ways. The Hebrew word used here when it talks about turned is that they're walking in a certain way, and God brings the judgment, and then they turn and go the other way. They completely turned around from the sinful lives they were living in and turned back towards God. They're expressing their belief through all of these actions. This is in great contrast to Jonah, right? Jonah, at many opportunities God has given him to live out his faith, has refused to, through his actions, show himself being repentant. But the Ninevites come before, humbly before God, and completely turn the other direction. They're expressing their belief. So how, how does this happen? This doesn't make sense. What caused this to to come about? Why did the Ninevites turn? Was it really Jonah's sermon? Was it fear of God? 
what are the things that could have led to this? Now, there's, there's a lot of theories. There's a couple things. Some historians say that there's a lot of things in society and their culture that was priming them from this moment, leading them to this. There were many plagues and famines and revolts and things that they would see as omens of a coming destruction in their world. So maybe they're being prepared for that as they were leading up to this moment. Maybe they're ready to hear this message from the prophet. But I don't think that fully explains this miraculous turnaround. Or maybe it was the fact that in each and every one of us, God has made a way for us to see his eternal qualities. We see this in Romans. Paul talks about it. It says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Maybe this was the moment they'd been waiting for. They've been seeing God in their world. They have no excuse to deny him. God intrinsically made all of us in a way that we can see his divine qualities. Maybe this contributed. We don't really know. We know that God sent his prophet to preach them We know that there are some circumstances. We know that God made each of us this way. But one thing we know for sure is that when God brings his mercy to anyone, it's fully him that is making it possible for us to turn back towards him. We go to verse 10 in our story, this final verse. It says, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he had threatened. God's mercy is in response to their repentance. But also, God's repentance is always the work of God. Or sorry, our repentance is always the work of God. 2 Timothy says, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. God is the one who always brings about repentance. God will grant them repentance. He brings mercy into our lives. His mercy is so clear and evident in this story. And God's unending mercy in the story of Jonah is so obvious. We just talked about it before, the way that he sends Jonah to be a part of this miracle. He sends the fish. He sends the storm. He tries to turn Jonah back. It's an amazing miracle that these people, that these Ninevites turn back towards God, and we know that it's only through his work And that makes me ask, what can we learn about the mercy of God? What can we learn about God's mercy? How can it come alongside in our lives? How can it impact us? How can we see it and understand it clearly? I want to look at just a few things as we look through Scripture, some features of God's mercy as it relates to us. The first one is this. God hears us when we ask for help. When we think about God's mercy, it's so important that he hears us when we ask for help. Psalm 86 says, You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all, all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I'm in distress, I call to you because you answer me. I have a friend. uh, maybe, Maybe you've had this. Maybe you have this friend too. Or sometimes you're talking to them. And they're like, yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, do you, do you ever just mess with them after a while and you're like, uh, hey, you have a spider on your head, mm-hmm. You know, like, because they just, they aren't with you. They aren't really listening. They're just so distracted. I think we've all had that person in our life where we're trying to talk to them. We want to be heard. We want to be seen. We want to be known. And they're just not listening. But the Bible tells us that God hears us when we ask for help. He hears us when we call to him. God is an amazing listener. He hears us and he responds. Not always as fast as we want, but he hears us and he responds. He responds with goodness, with forgiveness, and with abounding love. He's so attentive to our needs and our emotions and our pleas for help. He doesn't turn his back to us. He expresses great mercy through forgiveness and love, and he hears us when we ask for help. That's so valuable when it comes to a God who expresses his mercy to us, that he hears us when we call for help. When we decide to come before him humbly 
instead of refusing to call uncle, refusing to ask for help. God hears us. And the second feature of his mercy is that his mercy triumphs over judgment. James 2 says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I love that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy and judgment are both such important characteristics of who God is. Mercy is probably a much more popular uh, attribute of God than his judgment. Um, Judgment is something that we don't like to talk about, to think about so much that God would come and bring judgment to the world, but it's an essential piece of his character. It's so necessary. Without it, there wouldn't be any justice, any righteousness, and certainly there would be no mercy in our lives. We can't have one without the other. All of God's qualities are so important to who he is and so important to how our world works. Without God, without a God who would bring judgment, there's no hope. There's no hope for our world. Our world is so broken, it's so in need of healing and restoration. And we know from reading the Bible that God desires so deeply to restore the world, to bring his justice, his love, his mercy into it. And I think judgment sounds bad because we don't want to be the objects of God's judgment. That that doesn't sound good. Like, if you want to go judge someone else, like, okay, God's got a judgment. But if you're going to come and judge me, that gets difficult. But we know from reading scripture that God's judgment is always righteous and it's always good. Psalm 89 says righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. And 1 Peter says that God always judges impartially. God is a righteous and good judge. He has our best interest in mind. He seeks to restore the world by bringing about justice and maybe not always complete justice in our time, but enough for us to see it as a shadow of what's fully to come when he restores the world completely. And because God is this righteous judge, because of that, he also gets to extend mercy. We can't have one without the other. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone with whom one has the power to punish. So if I don't have the power to bring judgment and to punish, then I don't have the power to bring mercy into your life. Because God has that all-consuming power, he has the power to bring mercy into our life. Mercy is God's way of relenting when we're faced with something that we deserve. Now, according to God's law, and according to the evil actions of the Ninevites, they absolutely deserved the destruction that was coming to them. Jonah was not wrong in that regard. And God is both a righteous and a powerful judge, but a loving and merciful father. He desires to bring forgiveness, to restore his people to himself, to bring justice to our world. And I'm so thankful that his love and his mercy are so much stronger and powerful than our sin and our selfishness and our stubbornness to reject him and to turn from him. And God seeks after us despite our repeated rejection. Francis Chan says it this way, He says, the very fact that a holy, eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, merciful, fair, and just God loves you and me is nothing short of astonishing. The very fact that a holy, eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, merciful, fair, and just God loves you and me is nothing short of astonishing. Now, if you've ever listened to Francis Chan, you know that he would have said that with so much emotion that you would have been in tears right now. (laughs) But he makes a fair point. As I was sitting there watching my friend's son running continuously back and forth, I could see on his face his frustration, (laughs) his impatience, his tiredness, that time and time again he's running joyfully towards his own destruction. (laughs) And yet he continuously pulls him back in. It's astonishing that God loves us with the depth that he does because we're so stubborn. We continuously run joyfully away from him. And he brings us mercifully back in despite what we might deserve. He brings us close because God's mercy has the ability to triumph over judgment. Even though these are both essential aspects of his character, he extends this to us. Now, this is maybe more of the big picture theological, but what about the personal? The great thing about God's mercy is that it is so personal. We see this in Hebrews 4. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one 
who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God listens to us. And he extends mercy when judgment is what is deserved. But he does it in such a personal and relatable way. God desires to have a relationship with us. He desires to walk alongside of us. He desires to grant us mercy. He's not a judge that comes in just to carry out the sentence and slam the gavel and move on and do it in an impersonal way. God wants to be next to us and with us to minister to us, to empathize with us. He's been there before. He understands what we're going through. When I think about this passage, I can't help but think about one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite TV shows, uh, The West Wing. It's a hilarious show, but also has some meaningful moments in it if you've never seen it. And in one episode, uh, one of the characters has gone through a traumatic experience He's trying to find his way out, and he just feels buried and overwhelmed and consumed. And his colleague comes along to encourage him, and he tells him this story. He says, you see, there's this guy walking down the street, and he falls in a hole. And the walls are so steep, he can't get out. And then a doctor passes by, and the guy shouts up from the hole, hey, you, can you help me out? And the doctor writes a prescription, and he throws it down in the hole, and he walks on. Then a priest comes along. The guy shouts up, Father, I'm down here in this hole. Can you help me out? The priest writes out a prayer. He throws it down in the hole, and he moves on. Then a friend walks by. He calls up to him. He says, hey, friend, it's me. Can you help me out? And the friend jumps in the hole. And our, the guy down there is like, are you crazy? Now we're both down here. What good did that do? And the friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. Hebrews reminds us that Jesus has been there before, and he knows the way out. He walked the earth as a human. He faced everything we ever will or ever have. Not only does he know the way out, but Jesus is the way out. Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No one finds their way out except through him. Which brings us to our final point, final observation of God's mercy, which is that it brings us life. God's mercy brings us life. One of my favorite passages in all of scripture is Ephesians 2. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. Because of his great love for us, he extends his mercy. This is an amazing, an amazing passage that God says that he has a way to bring us life. I thought about this this week, and I thought, it is not easy to bring about life. I remember when I was a kid, and my parents wanted to sort of teach me this lesson, and they gave me a seed, and it was for a tree, and they taught me how to plant it, how to dig the hole and cover it back up and put it in a place where I get enough sun and how often to water it so that I don't kill it by overwatering or underwatering and then just to have patience, right? And we prayed for this tree to grow and we took care of it the best we could and for a long time we don't see anything come up through the ground and then finally we start to see this little bit come on up through and peek through and then over time It grows a little taller, and we put supports on it so it doesn't fall over in the Kansas wind, and it gets bigger and stronger. And I remember years later after we moved away, we went back and we took a look, and this tree was taller than the house, and I couldn't believe that I'd been a part of this process of nothing bringing life. But I did so little in hindsight looking back on this. God made this world in such a unique way 
that life can happen, that it can grow, that it can be brought about. God is the one who brings about life in our world. He provides just the right conditions. Not just the right conditions for a tree to grow on earth, but the right conditions for us to have life in this world. For us to know his son. For us to be reconciled. For him to extend his mercy to us so that we can come and to know him. Ephesians says that we were once dead. Because we tried to follow our own thoughts, our own desires, as Jonah did, to have our own vision for our life. And because of that, we didn't find satisfaction, we didn't find purpose, we didn't find life. We were deserving of wrath, we were deserving of destruction, just like the Ninevites were. But then we get to verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, gives us life in Christ. God has the ability to move us from apathy to love, to bring us from darkness into light, to bring us from extreme immorality to purity, and to bring us from this shallow religiosity to genuine faith. And God can change our desire from wanting to run away from him to wanting to run towards him into his arms. So how does he do this? Because it just seems, it almost seems unbelievable, not really possible that God could really do this in my life and all of our lives despite all the ways that we ignore him and run from him. God does this by extending a mercy that hears us and sees us. Remember God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, something prophets never do, something so unusual, but it's because God saw the Ninevites. He heard them. It says that their wickedness came up before him. God sought them when they were dead to bring them life. He had a plan. God hears us and he sees us in his mercy. And God's mercy triumphs over his judgment. He helped the Ninevites to turn completely from their wickedness and back towards him. And then he relented. He extended mercy instead of judgment. God is so merciful that he personally pursues us. He personally pursued Jonah. He could see his hard heart He invites him to be a part of this miracle of coming to Nineveh. And even when Jonah turns away, God sends the storm to redirect him. And then he sends the miracle of the fish to swallow him up. He tries to turn him around. He rescues him. He gives him a second chance. It's amazing that after everything they've been through, God gives him the second chance of saying, please go to Nineveh again. I want you to be a part of this. God is so personal with us. He's so merciful that he brings life to the evil Ninevites whom everyone else had written off, not just Jonah, but all of his countrymen. And all of this is just a shadow of the mercy that we see expressed by God through his son Jesus. When Jesus came to save those who have their own vision, people just like us, Jesus came to save those who run from God. He came to save those who don't care about God. He came to save those who run from him willfully because his love is so much stronger than our sin, so much stronger than our selfishness, so strong that it overcame death so that we could have life. As the passage says, it's because of his great love for us that God who's rich in mercy made us alive in Christ even when we were dead. It is by grace we have been saved. Let's pray as we prepare for communion. Father, we thank you